But of course, the most elaborate of health systems cannot survive without the regular provision of essential drugs and supplies. The Gambia's pharmacy services have been keeping pace with the overall rapid development of the health sector. About four years ago or three years ago, we got two new stores constructed. That's the one in SO, which means health facilities like SO, Kerewan, Kuntaya, they don't have to close anymore to come to Banjo to collect their supplies. They can get their supplies directly from SO. That's one development. Then the other also is that even the stores that we had we are old and they were rehabilitated and the storage facilities improved. That's also another development. And also Basse, now it has its own store. Like people used to come all the way from Fatoto and others to go to Bansang. Now their store is there. We are still here at the Center Medical Stores, but I can tell you that we hope by end of next year we'll have a new warehouse. As you can see, this is an old building. It's a colonial building, actually. And mm -hmm. um, we have now, government have secured the funds to build a modern warehouse because also storage capacity is very limited in this place. I'm sure when you look out, you see that they, we are storing our supplies all over the place. So that is also an achievement. We haven't got the store yet, but we are just waiting for cabinet approval now to be able to construct the new store. So that's also an achievement in terms of infrastructure. I'm sure you have realized that there has been a lot of expansion in the health services. And obviously with the expansion, there is also an increase in the demand of the supplies. Because as more facilities you have, it means you need more supplies to meet the needs of the facilities. And definitely there has been a lot of improvement in that area. If you look at the drug supply, the, the per capita that is spent is, has increased. Obviously we will still experience some problems with shortages and so on because the population is expanding, the demand is increasing, and also the more qualified people you have in the facilities, it means the more the demand increases. Because if you have there a doctor, obviously, you will, it means that you will have to use all the drugs that we use in a hospital, and that is what is happening. Most of the drugs that, if you have come here about eight years ago, before we got the Cuban doctors, for example, that we would never find in a small health center. Now, if you go to a small clinic, you'll find them there because there is a doctor who can use them. So obviously that has also improved and definitely we have seen an increase in the budget to meet the needs of the health facility. So that's also another improvement. And then also for manpower, there is also some improvement. Yeah, because we, there are not many pharmacists in the country. And we have got a lot of pharmacists trained in these recent years through WGO fellowship and so on, but through government endeavors and also the, the project funds and so on. Likewise, we are also training more pharmacy assistants and so on. Because apart from just buying the drugs and supplying it, we are also responsible in training our staff who will be capable of actually supplying the drugs, dispensing to patients and so on. Okay, the National AIDS Control Program tells me that you are probably just about to begin the use of antiretroviral drugs in the Gambia. Yeah. Okay, could you tell us what kinds of preparations you have made to arrive at this stage and how soon will you begin the dispensing of such drugs? We have done a lot of work in that area. I'm sure you are aware of the ARI, the Accelerated Resource Implementation which meant that within 90 days, we started developing the whole system as to getting the drugs into place. And one of the issues is that for the ARV drugs, they are different from the treatment of malaria, for example. If you start a patient on ARV drugs, it's a lifetime treatment. It's not a one-week treatment, it's not a one-year treatment, which means that you have to make sure that you have the supplies you need throughout and you also have to get the infrastructure in place because you have to do some tests and so on. And also, I'm sure you would all agree that ARV drugs is a new field for all of us. When I was being trained as a pharmacist, there was nothing like HIV AIDS at that time to be able to know much about ARV drugs. It was just coming out at that time, it was being diagnosed and so on, and there were practically no treatment. So all of us, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, we have to go back to learn about the ARVs. Mm. And that also was part of the process of preparing for the, for the ARV and that we have done. We have trained the first batch in the Gambia. It was two weeks at Kairaba. 
an intensive course on the use of ARVs. We are setting up the lab for the treatment of ARV because you need special equipment for that, not the routine test that you are doing at this point in time. And also we have placed the orders and the drugs have arrived. So we are just finalizing the distribution system, getting the patients, because also one important thing is that it's not every patient who is HIV positive is eligible for treatment. There are certain criteria defined by WHO. So we are now in the process of selecting those patients who are eligible for treatment. So hopefully, because I'm not the only one doing it, there is a teamwork. We have people from the private sector, from NGOs, from the government sector, we are all working together as a team to get this off the ground. And hopefully, by August, we should have our first patients to be on ARV in this country, which is a major achievement, I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. One main issue is that the supply of drugs is one of the key activities in any health service delivery system. No matter how good your hospitals are, no matter how well trained your staff are, without the drugs, you cannot go far. So obviously we are aware of our roles and our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And in that, we are always working towards how to improve things. And one of the main concerns right now is our storage facility. Because definitely, we are, as we have sorted out those at the regional and divisional level, this being the main store where all the consignment comes in is actually the main issue. And I'm glad that it's being dealt with. Because if you come here and find us trying to unload four 40-foot containers. At one time, we received nine 40-foot containers as one shipment. It's really a crisis. So that alone is getting a warehouse, and it's going to be a modern warehouse, I can tell you that, is going to be like one of the main issues. Then also the budget, the, the, the list of drugs that we purchase, because it's an, you always have to look at the list of items you're purchasing to make improvements and so on. So our role will always be an important and key role, and the government is aware of that, and they are always, we are always in dialogue as to how to get things improved. But just as drugs are vital to the successful running of an effective healthcare system, so also is a reliable fleet of vehicles to transport supplies and move patients between facilities. An innovative partnership arrangement between the Department of State for Health and Social Welfare and a non-governmental organization known as Riders for Health appears to be paying rich dividends. There was an MOU, it was approved by Cabinet in 2001, and then we had a contract signed with government in 2002, mandating us to manage their transports. So as of now, government health services, uh, I mean, subvent to us resources annually and we also add our own little resources from our fundraising to help manage transports to run health, health I mean, healthcare services in the country. Transport in the health sector is crucial. It could mean life or death. Um, we took up transport, we took up an ambulance straight away. A patient on board being taken to the nearest health, health center or hospital. That patient can lose his life or her life if that transport breaks down or fails to, to reach the site or where it should go to in time. So our role is to ensure that transport works when it's required, and if it's required, it is there to serve the patient and the community. So we maximize government little resources with our additional input for the community to benefit. We ensure that transport, I mean those transport with patients, with nurses, go on their outreach, go on the referral, and don't break down. And that's what we do. So we stop fuel, we stop parts, we employ technicians, we employ drivers to ensure, we also put in place systems to ensure the smooth, efficient operation of vehicles for health service delivery. If you ask the health service personnel, since we came on board two years ago, there has never ever been fuel shortage in the health sector, even, even in the case of national shortages. So fuel can be short in the country, but health has fuel for their vehicles to move around. So we ensure we stock fuel. We have five fuel depots uh, in, in, in Karnefin, in Farafenye, in Mansa Konko, in Bansang, and in Base. 
and those five fuel depots we and so they are constantly stocked with fuel. So that even if the country runs out of fuel, we can assure health that they have fuel to do their services. The transport pillar is very important and that is why the Department of State for Health and Social Welfare signed a memorandum of understanding with an NGO called Riders for Health. And Riders for Health will be responsible for managing all, all health sector transport, providing fuel and maintenance. Before, they used to call it transport unit. And you all know what happened in transport units prior to 1994, whereby vehicles are taken, it will take a long time for them to be maintained, and sometimes spare parts disappear. So it has been found not to be efficient. And that's why some of these skill sorted areas, government tend to hive off some of these activities in the home of NGOs to run health, I mean, transport on behalf of the health sector. And to be very honest with you, Riders for Health, despite some of the constraints and the challenges they have faced, they have done significantly well in trying to improve transport resource management in the health sector. If you look at the recent ambulances donated to the health sector by His Excellency President, and Riders for Health is running those ambulances on a zero breakdown maintenance. And not only that, but Riders for Health will also provide fuel. Fuel supply is more centralized now at Riders for Health, properly controlled. So at least at any given time, essential services do not suffer. Like reference, they don't suffer. Those are essential services that fuel is provided for. And as a result, Riders for Health manages the fuel supply of the dust fleet of vehicles and undertakes routine maintenance of the Department of State for Health Vehicles. Without which, certainly, if you have a lot of breakdown and if the fuel supply is not controlled, then that can affect essential services like reference. So in essence, Riders for Health is a very important partner in development. And recently we had a meeting with Riders for Health. They are the providers of transport and we are the recipients. So we had a meeting in the Department of State for Health and Social Welfare where the providers and recipients came together so that we can review the Member of Understanding with Riders for Health. And through that consultation and dialogue, we have also come with a way forward. This time we call it efficient transport management in the health sector. In other words, the emphasis, if we are really keen on the health sector reform changing for good, we also have to look at some certain efficiency measures that are designed to improve service delivery. And here the focus would be on essential services. Transport are meant for service delivery. And the target would be for service delivery. Yes, we understand also that transport could be crucial for staff and so on. But it can be controlled and managed in such a way that services don't suffer. And that is the fundamental focus of healthcare reform changing for good. And we are working closely with Riders for Health in that regard. They are also going to look at and cost the entire transportation of the health service. We need to know that. We need to know the cost of transport in the entire health sector. They have the data. They will do all this costing for us. And that is also going to be incorporated into our strategy planning. And at the end of the day, you will be able to see how much you are spending on transport, how much you are spending on fuel, so that at least when you come to introduce efficiency measures, you will know which direction to take. And if you have an entire costing of the transport system, you can be able to work out replacement for all the transport. And I think that's very important. The other major responsibility associated with the running of the country's health care services is the Gambia Social Welfare Program. The work of the Department of Social Welfare is the Gambia government uh, department responsible for vulnerable members of our society and we pr um, provide welfare services to needy families, children, the disabled, as well as the elderly within our society. Within the child care unit, we provide child protection services for um, children in um, difficult circumstances. We also provide services for adoption as well as minors traveling overseas. We also provide educational sponsorship for orphans and children from needy families. At the moment, we are sponsoring over 1,000 children. However, from 94 to date, we have over 7,000 children that have been sponsored 
countrywide, and most of them are in various walks of life, from the public to private sector. We also presently having a child center where we provide services to um, 50 needy children. These children we are spending most of their time in the street and either assisting destitute parents and begging or um, out in the street walking and we were able to bring them into the center through the Gambia government Center Chattel Bank collaboration and now we provide them with three basic meals. We've in integrated them as well in the normal school system and they spend most of their time in the center uh, before going to school to have their meals. Also we assisted with remedial classes. We're able to provide their parents and carers with skills training in soap making and tie and dye for income generation as well as for family care and support. Mm -hmm. This is within um, the child care unit. Mm -hmm. We also, um, through collaboration with other NGOs, set up the Child Protection Alliance, mm -hmm. which is as which serves as an advocacy body mm -hmm. for uh, child rights promotion and protection. Within the adult care unit also, we have poverty relief programs for destitute families, of which we assist over 890 destitute families monthly with um, assistance from the relief assistance board for emergency relief in terms of cash as well as clothing. With regards to disability, we have we've just visited the workshop. We have 5,000 clients that we assist in provision of wheelchairs as well as um, um, orthopedic aids and also other technical aids. And um, this is done by Gambia government free of cost. We repair wheelchairs, supply wheelchairs to disabled. We also prepare artificial limbs. This usually costs us quite a substantial sum of money. But because of commitments that the government have with regards to the welfare of the disabled, it is done free of cost. And quite a lot of amputees we are witnessing at the moment. We have about 3,000 clients who are all amputees, and they, do, they are provided with artificial limbs by the department as you visited in the workshop. In their task of providing health services to the people of the Gambia, the government and the Department of State for Health and Social Welfare continue to count on the support of the country's development partners. In the health sector, certainly, we are privileged to work with very benevolent and generous partners. And one of them is the World Health Organization, WHO. WHO has been very instrumental and supportive to the health sector in providing training to a lot of health sector staff. And in our country program with WHO, they also provide funding for the implementation of certain programs, like the malaria program, the integrated management of childhood illnesses, IMCI, reproductive health, and in many, many areas where WHO provide funding through our country program to help implement some of the basic activities. So here we are seeing a government donor partnership, where our government has done significantly to improve the level of healthcare and the donors are coming in to purchase the efforts of government. So here, certainly, WHO has been very instrumental. UNICEF also is a very, very important partner in development. They have been helping the Department of State for Health in providing some drugs, especially to children between the ages of six months to five years. And that support from UNICEF has been very instrumental in helping especially the infants against malaria and other diseases. And they have also been very instrumental in providing training opportunities and also helping programs with funding to implement some of their activities. We also have bilateral partners like the Republic of Cuba. It is very clear that the Cuban government has provided the Gambian government a lot of doctors. We know a lot of our Gambian doctors have left the public health system and have gone into the private sector. And therefore, we had a serious problem, a serious shortage of doctors and indeed nurses in our public health care system. And the Cuban government has come in through a bilateral cooperation agreement with Cuba, of course, with the dynamic intervention of His Excellency President. That's why you have Cuban doctors in this country. They are deployed to all the major hospitals, all the minor health centers, all the major health centers, even at the village level, to provide accessibility to health care. We also have a very, very important bilateral cooperation with the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria has been a very important partner to the Gambia as far as the provision of healthcare is concerned. Again, we have a lot of Nigerian doctors and specialists scattered around our healthcare system and they have been providing quality healthcare to the people of this country. Another important partner is the Islamic Republic of Egypt. 
sorry, or I want to say the Republic of Egypt. They have also been providing doctors, trained doctors, qualified doctors. As you know, Egypt definitely is an advanced country as far as science and medicine is concerned. And they have helped the government of the Gambia in providing a lot of Egyptian doctors in different specialties. And they have been deployed also in our hospitals to provide quality health care. Not forgetting, of course, one of our very important partners, that is the Republic of China on Taiwan. They have been very instrumental in also assisting the Department of State for Health and Social Welfare in trying to support some of our technical assistance personnel on the ground. So the, power, the Republic of China on Taiwan certainly has been a very important and useful partner in helping government to improve the quality of health care. So you have noted that um, UNDP is an important partner, UNFPA are important partners, and you have a lot of other important partners who are interested in healthcare because they know and they understand that without a proper health care, certainly you cannot address poverty. And if you cannot address poverty, you cannot guarantee peace and stability. So here we have to look at it in a holistic manner. And this has been the cornerstone and the basis of our healthcare policy. And the reform that is going on now, we call it healthcare reform changing for good, is geared towards looking at the issues in a multi-sectoral fashion, in a global fashion in a more integrated fashion, in a more coordinated manner, so that at least the, the outputs of our policy will reflect the true realities on the ground. And here, we are going down on the ground to also see how best we can integrate the basic services. Sometimes on the ground you have health, education, agriculture. And all these various sectors are working together to provide quality health care to the people. So if they are disintegrated, obviously, the people will not get the benefits of healthcare delivery, of educational services, of agricultural services. So we thought it prudent also to challenge other sectors, for us to challenge ourselves to integrate all these basic services at the lower level to be coordinated by the Department of Community Development. And that integrative approach will also encourage the donors to pump in money at the lower level for the benefit of the people. Here also, the reform of the health sector is geared towards integration of basic services also integration of programs at the central level and also at the peripheral level. Because we thought it prudent that after a proper diagnosis of the entire health sector, we thought it prudent to move away from the vertical arrangement of programs towards a more horizontal realignment of the program and to integrate the programs so that they will all be geared towards a unified direction that is providing affordable, accessible health care to the people. And that is the bottom line. And so, with a 70% increase in the number of medical doctors in the public health sector, and with the Gambia counting 0.2 physicians for every 1,000 persons, a ratio higher than the sub-Saharan regional average of 0.1 physicians for the same number of persons, it is time to ask about the formula that has led to these stunning successes. Uh, the health sector is a national priority to government. Uh, when I say government, I mean His Excellency, the President of the Republic, Alahaji Dr. Yahya A.J.J. Jambe. Um, most of these developments happened just recently, in the past few years. And these developments happened because of his vision, his mission, and because whatever we are doing in this sector, it is through his inspiration, his guidance, his encouragement, and of course his concern uh, about the health of the people of this country. That is why we came up with a health policy, changing for good, as the title of our health policy. And, and I, I guess you have seen that on the ground. The health sector has changed and it will change for good. Uh, this is compared to before 1994. All these things happened after the revolution of 1994, July 22nd. Uh, we also have the health action plan whereby we stipulated all the actions we plan all what we are doing in the health sector. So we know exactly what we have done, where we are, and where we are heading to. We have our PER, public expenditure review, 
that means we can tell finance or any institution, be it national or sub-regional or regional or international, exactly what we want and for what program. And all these things are targeted towards achieving the Millennium Development Goals. These are targets set by the United Nations for the whole world. And they are all targeted towards achieving our Abuja targets. These are health targets set by the African heads of states during their summit in Abuja, Nigeria. And of course, to fulfill the targets of the World Health Organization, the West African Health Organization, and other development partners. So that is why we are focused. And I, I, I am happy you have seen for yourself what is happening all over the country. Again, the reason for all this is His Excellency always tell me that he wants health service delivery accessible and affordable to all Gambians. Affordability and accessibility is the key. So that is why uh, he, if you hear him talk, he will always say a healthy nation would always be a productive nation. And all these are inspirations from him. That is why we have done what you have seen on the ground. Okay, <clears throat> one major area in which we have seen change is the transformation of the Royal Victoria Hospital into a fully fledged teaching hospital. Um, can you guide us through the considerations that led to that? Yes, um, Royal Victoria Hospital was a general hospital. It was an old, general, out-of-date, backward hospital. So, um, again, I, I refer to our mentor, the president, who told me that uh, um, we have to get doctors and nurses from abroad to help us in the health sector so that Gambians' uh, health are taken good care of. And he did that. He brought all these doctors from all over the world, Cuba, Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, United Kingdom as, as, as VSOs, United States of America as Peace Corps, British doctors and nurses or health personnel in general. And when he did that, then he said, okay, you can give somebody fish to eat, but it's better when you teach that person how to fish that is more sustainable. Because all these technical assistance are based on our bilateral political relations with these countries. And that is uh, sometimes not predictable. So he then decided that he would set a medical school, which he did. And uh, he went to Cuba, he met his colleague Fidel Castro and told him that he wants to set a medical school so that we can train our own doctors to replace all these technical assistance we are getting. So again, it's, the, it's, a, it's another vision and mission of, uh, of, 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 of His Excellency the President. Setting a medical school means that we have to get an institution, which is a teaching hospital, so that the medical students could be taught properly to become doctors. And that is exactly why we have converted the Royal Victoria General Hospital into the Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital, which is now up and running perfectly well. Okay, uh, you mentioned in passing the Millennium Development Goals. If we look into the future a little, how do you see the Gambia's health services progressing into the future and uh, rising up to the challenge of uh, providing health for the Gambian people? The future is very bright because, as I said before, we know where we come from before 1994. We know exactly where we are after 1994 and we know where we are heading to because we are very focused. The Gambia Health Service Delivery System would be excellent in the very near future. And in fact, it is already because there is no country in this sub-region that has a better health service than us. Um, the Gambia is the only country in the whole world 
where health service delivery is almost free of charge. Not in the United Kingdom, not in the United States of America, certainly not <laughs> just cross the border and go to Senegal and see. Even to see a doctor, you will have to pay for it. They call it ordinance. Whatever the doctor writes on your prescription is your business to go and sort that out. The state doesn't contribute a penny towards your healthcare system in Senegal. So this is, I can say, this is the only country in the whole world without any insurance, form of insurance system, without anything, and government is paying everything health-wise for its citizenry. And of course, there is no waiting list here. Go to the United Kingdom. Before you get a simple operation done, it will take you six months. Of course, the patient-doctor ratio has dramatically decreased in this country. And of course, our, our patient-bed ratio is, is excellent at the moment. There is full accessibility. There is no Gambian who walks more than five kilometers to see a qualified doctor. So the future is already bright. And the Millennium Development Goals you are talking about, the Abuja targets, we have met all of them as I talk to you now. So we are just trying to excel on them. So all the targets have already been met. We have achieved our primary health care goals, which are set by the international communities. And uh, we are now just working on disease eradication programs. In fact, we've just, uh, the Gambia government just received a letter from the World Health Organization congratul congratulating the government for eradicating the raccoonculosis. Raccoonculosis is a genie worm disease. We don't have diseases like poliomyelitis, neonatal tetanus. All these diseases are, 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 are not existing in this country. But we have not yet got our certificate because of the neighboring countries, because of certain countries in Africa have not done enough work. And WHO is afraid that when they certify us, when they give us eradication certificate because of the frequent air travel and because of the movement, globalization and so forth, we may see these diseases again. That is why they are holding on to our certificate of eradication in most of these diseases. So, are there any frontiers ahead that you are aspiring to reach? Yes. What we are aspiring to reach is to reduce, maximally reduce morbidity and mortality caused by common diseases like malaria. And of course, you know, diseases like HIV, AIDS, which the whole world is talking about, we, our incident here is very low, but we are not complacent. As you can see, there is a lot of concern, a lot of IEC, a lot of efforts are made to make sure our prevalence, uh, our zero prevalence rate on HIV AIDS remain rock bottom low. That is why we have created the National AIDS Secretariat. That's why there is National AIDS Council under the office of the president. That's why the government took $15 million loan from World Bank to fight the disease. That is why uh, we are reaching all sectors of society to make sure HIV AIDS remain rock bottom low in this country. Although it's not our number one killer disease, but we are not complacent. Okay, uh, Dr. Kasama, one other thing that uh, I'd like to ask you. Um, how are we doing when it comes to indicators? All these uh, developments and changes we have seen and improvements in health delivery, how have they impacted on the health indicators of this country? Well, um, our health indicators are good. They are very promising. In fact, they are one of the best in the sub-region. Although I must say we are not complacent, as far as Gambia is concerned, we will work very hard to bring our health indicators to those of the developed countries. We cannot say, yes, we are a little bit better than sub-Saharan African average, so we, are, we stop there. No. No, we are not complacent at all. But our infant mortality rate is decreased, has decreased in the past and is still decreasing. Our maternal mortality rates are really on the decline and our life expectancies are in improving. I must say they are okay, but I am absolutely not complacent. 
unless I say, unless we say we are now a power with the developed world indicators, then we can say yes, we can relax. But in fact, some of our indicators in some of our, our units, like the I unit indicators, are, all, are now comparable to developed world indicators already. But we want all others, like maternal mortality, infant mortality, life expectancy, to be similar to any developed world indicators. And we will get there very soon.